You can watch this and other programs online at booktv.org. Dinesh D'Souza presents his thoughts on what a second term for the Obama administration would look like. The author contends that the president's policies would greatly reduce America's global influence. It's about an hour ten. Thank you. Please sit down. I'm um, excited and thrilled to be here with um, Barack Obama in this election year. I think we are um, dealing with one of the most uh, mysterious and uh, odd figures ever to uh, occupy the Oval Office. A few days ago, I received a phone call. I didn't recognize the area code, and the phone call was actually from Kenya. Uh, and I answered it, and it was actually George Obama, the president's half-brother. He's uh, the uh, youngest son of Barack Obama Sr. And uh, he said, Dinesh, um, I'm calling because my two-year-old son is in the hospital. He has a serious chest condition, and I wonder if you'd be willing to help me. And I said, are you at the hospital, George? And he said, yes. I said, well, hand, me, hand the phone over to the nurse. Uh, so he did, and the nurse confirmed that uh, George's son is, is sick with a chest infection. So I told George I would send him $1,000 by Western Union. But before I hung up the phone, I said, George, uh, isn't there anybody else you can ask? Why are you calling me? <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, no. He said, Dinesh, and this was the line that kind of killed me, he said, you're like a brother to me. Now, I thought to myself, here is a young man who is the um, half-brother of the President of the United States. Barack Obama is not only a multimillionaire, but he's the most powerful man in the world. And yet his half-brother can't call him in a time of need, and this same half-brother is living in a six-by-ten hut, slumdog millionaire style, uh, in the Haruma slum of Nairobi. He has to walk through sewage to get to the nearest street. So this is a guy living not just in poverty, but you'd have to say in third world poverty. So what's going on here? The, the simple explanation is that Barack Obama is a hypocrite. Uh, he has made the idea that we have obligations to our fellow man the centerpiece of his re-election campaign. Uh, one of his favorite lines, which he recently uttered at the National Prayer Breakfast, is, we are our brother's keeper. In, uh, in my film, 2016, by the way, the film is coming to Michigan. Uh, you should just look at our website, 2016themovie.com. But in the film, I ask George that. I say, George, um, Obama says we are our brother's keeper. You're his brother. What has he done to keep you? And quite revealingly, revealingly George says, go ask him. So hypocrisy would seem to be the natural explanation. But by the way, George is not an isolated case. Uh, Barack Obama has an aunt, his father's sister, not counting his immediate family. This is his closest living relative. And as we speak, she is selling coal on the streets of a small village uh, in Kenya. She has no teeth uh, and wants to get dentures but doesn't have the money. Uh, Obama hasn't contributed a penny to help her either. In 2006, Obama went to his uh, hometown of Kogelo, where his father grew up. There's a local school there, and they were so excited he was coming, they renamed the school Barack Obama School. Obama toured the school with all kinds of celebrities and the pr prime minister of Kenya. And Obama said, I'm going to help the school. I'm going to provide books and facilities. I see you don't have sanitation. You don't have proper water supplies. I'm going to look after you. Since then, the school has sent multiple requests and letters and reminders. 
with absolutely no help forthcoming from Obama. So once again, the simple explanation is we're just dealing with the guy who doesn't live by his own standard. But I want to suggest that there's actually a deeper mystery than that. Something else is going on. And here we get to the heart of the ideological mystery of Barack Obama. Who is this guy? Interestingly, both on the left and on the right, there is an effort to uh, fit Obama into American history. Oh, he's a civil rights guy. Oh, he's a Martin Luther King guy. Oh, he's a, he's a progressive. And even among conservatives, you get kind of the same thing, an effort to shoehorn Obama into some idea of American history. I want to argue that that attempt very often ignores Obama's own history, his own story. One of the most uh, striking aspects in the film is we actually use Obama's own voice. Uh, I kind of got the idea for the film. I was surfing on Amazon, and I noticed that Obama had read his own book in audiobooks. And it's quite a striking book because when you listen to Obama, I mean, for example, he, he does multiple accents. He does blacks, he does whites, he does men, he does women. Uh, and I realized here is Obama telling his own story. So I got the idea of uh, teaming up with a Hollywood guy. I was lucky to find Gerald Molin. Uh, this is a kind of a closet conservative in Hollywood, um, longtime partner of Steven Spielberg, uh, the producer of Twister and uh, Jurassic Park, uh, Hook, uh, Schindler's List. So the, the advantage of getting a guy like that is that this film is not like a TV documentary. It's more like, uh, it's like out of Africa. And it's shot in Hawaii, Chicago, New York, London, India, Indonesia, Kenya. Uh, and it raises the curtain on, on Barack Obama, on who this guy is and on what his underlying compass is. Where does he actually want to, to take America? Uh, the puzzle of Obama is that we tend to try to understand him in conventional democratic categories. So, for example, Obama will block and restrict and regulate oil drilling in America. And we're tempted to say, well, well yeah, he's, he's kind of an environmentalist. He's kind of another Al Gore. He's worried that, in, in Gore's words, you know, the, the earth has a fever, global warming. But then when we watch Obama a little more closely, we realize that's not really right. Because while Obama is blocking oil drilling in America, he is promoting it in other countries. He, through the Export-Import Bank, he gives billions of dollars in taxpayer money uh, to Brazil, to Colombia, and to Mexico to drill for oil. So then you have a, a, a deeper mystery. Why is Obama for oil drilling over there, but not over here? What's really going on? When we turn to uh, taxes and debt, we find kind of the same thing. Uh, Obama seems to be spending money promiscuously, uh, racking up the national debt. By the way, the highest Bush deficit in one year was under 500 billion, and Bush was a big spender. The lowest Obama deficit is a trillion dollars. So Obama's added $5 trillion to the national debt, Presumably, in the next four years, if he's re-elected, he'll add five trillion more. At that point, America would be 20 trillion dollars in debt, 20,000 billion dollars in debt. One half of that debt added by one man. So from George Washington through George W. Bush, 10 trillion dollars. Under Obama in eight years, 10 more. And the danger of that is that America now is not, wouldn't just be facing decline, America would be facing collapse. So again, it's one thing for a rich country to spend irresponsibly to rack up the credit card, but a certain point comes in which any responsible person can see that you're reaching the point where somebody is gonna come and take away your car and your furniture and your TV and your house. So why would you keep spending in that way even when you were approaching that point? What possible logic could that have? And then when you look on the international scene, you see some extremely troubling developments that are equally mysterious. Obama says we have to prevent genocide, and he uses force against Libya. The number of people killed by Gaddafi at that point was about 250. 
Meanwhile, over a period of many months, tens of thousands of people have been killed in Syria, and o Obama absolutely refuses to use force. What explains why he intervenes with force over here but not over there? Obama has been very active in Egypt in pushing Mubarak out of power. Not only that, but now that there's a power struggle going on between the, the military and the Muslim Brotherhood, the Obama administration is intervening on the side of the Muslim Brotherhood. Obama has warned the Egyptian military, you better turn over power to the Muslim Brotherhood or we're going to cut off military aid. So Obama can say, well, I'm a champion of democracy. These people were freely elected. And yet, a year earlier, in 2009, when there were massive demonstrations bigger than in Tahrir Square in Iran, calling for democracy, the end of the mullahs, free elections, Obama flatly refused to support the, de the, the Democrats. He said, we got to stay out of this. There's a big debate going on in Iran. We'll let them settle it. And it was settled with truncheons, with the mullahs basically beating up the protesters, and that was that. Again, why is Obama intervening here but not there? As far as I can tell, no explanation. So here to get Obama, it's not enough just to look at the things he's doing. You kind of have to dig a little bit and see why he's doing them. What's the underlying single standard that can unravel Obama's apparent double standards? I think we get a clue from this when we actually look at Obama's past. Obama's dream is quite clearly not the American dream. Uh, at least not as understood by the founders. Uh, it's not even Martin Luther King's dream. The theme of the film, and actually of my new book, which is called Obama's America, Obama's dream is the dream from his father. That's the title of Obama's autobiography. But his father, who, was, who grew up in Kenya, who was a third world guy, who was an anti-American guy, who was by his own claim a socialist, he was also, you might say, an anti-colonialist. His father was actually absent for most of Obama's life. What I didn't realize when I first started writing about this was the enormous impact of Obama's mother. Obama's mother is presented by Obama as the white bread girl from Kansas, kind of the all-American girl. But she was actually quite a radical. Uh, she was a sort of 60s girl before the 60s. And she wanted to marry a third world anti-American guy and found one, Barack Obama. He divorced her and she went looking for another third world anti-American guy and she found one again, an Indonesian guy uh, named Lolo Satoro. The point about Obama's mother was that even in the absence of the father, the mother cultivated in young Obama this reverence for the absentee dad. She said, your father is a sort of a, a mythic figure. He's a, he's a hero, kind of like she might compare him to Mandela or Gandhi, a great freedom fighter. Now, in reality, Barack Obama was not that. Uh, he was either philandering at Harvard or driving drunk in Kenya. He ultimately killed a man in a drunk driving accident. So this was not the real Barack Obama Sr., but this was the idea cultivated in Obama's mind. Interestingly, when Obama got a little bit older, he realized that his dad was not like that. His sister told him, why are you revering this great dad of ours? Uh, he actually was not the guy you think he was. And Obama has a sort of a crisis. One of the pivotal scenes in our film is when Obama goes to his father's grave and sort of reconciles with his father, and he does it actually in a very creative way. What he does, he has the choice of sort of accepting his father with all his flaws or just flatly rejecting him. And what he actually does is he splits the difference. He divides his father into two, good father and bad father. And he says, I'm not going to be like my father as a man. I'm not going to copy him in his personality, but I am going to take his dream. I am going to adopt his ideals. I'm going to make them mine. I'm going to carry them out. So this is Barack Obama's, if you will, anti-colonial dream. And interestingly, throughout his life, Obama sought out a whole bunch of guys. I call them Obama's founding fathers. You're not going to find Madison or Jefferson on that list. 
Um, these are the guys that Obama sought out. He didn't bump into them on the street. And it's quite a group. In Hawaii, the former communist Frank Marshall Davis. Uh, at Columbia, the Palestinian radical Edward Said, member of the Palestine National Council, described by Commentary Magazine as a professor of terror. In, um, at Harvard Law School, uh, Brazilian socialist Roberto Mangabeira Unger. By the way, this is a guy who has called for Russia, China, India, and Brazil to, as he puts it, gang up on the United States. He says our, pr the premier goal right now is to end American hegemony. In other words, bring America down from being number one. So number two, three, four, five, and six need to team up to pull down America. This guy, Roberto Unger, uh, left Harvard in the 90s to join the socialist government of Brazil. Uh, he was too radical even for them, so they threw him out. Now he's back at Harvard where I, he seems to fit right in. Um, then uh, Obama went on to um, hitch up with a domestic terrorist, Bill Ayers. And then Jeremiah Wright, Mr. Goddamn America himself. So these were his buddies. These were the people who Obama saw as surrogate fathers, people who, in a sense, could teach him chapter and verse of the anti-colonial ideology. Now, what was this ideology? The key to understanding anti-colonialism is that wealth is seen as the product of theft. The key anti-colonial idea is that how did the rich countries become rich? Why do people live better? in Britain and Germany and America than they do in, let's say, Rio de Janeiro or Jakarta or Mumbai? Answer, because the West invaded and occupied and looted all those countries, taking all their stuff. So wealth in this view is not earned. It's not the result of creativity or initiative. It's basically the result of piracy. In 1965, Barack Obama Sr. wrote an article in the East Africa Journal he was talking about what does a country do when you've got all these rich guys at the top. And he, me he mentions a bunch of solutions, but one of them is very high tax rates. And he says, I'm quoting him now, theoretically, there's nothing that sh can stop the government from taxing 100% of income. 100% tax rates. Now you might say, well, anyone who's familiar with economics would know that this is kind of nuts. Why would anyone propose it? But once you plug in the underlying anti-colonial idea, it actually makes sense. Imagine if you came to my house and stole all my furniture. What's the proper tax rate for you? 100%, because it's not your furniture. If wealth is seen as appropriated, then there's nothing wrong with the government using all its power to take it back. Let's fast forward now to Obama's recent comment to business guys. You didn't build that. Not you. It's society. Society created the wealth. You, the entrepreneur, you're swooping in and skimming off the top. It doesn't belong to you. And so this, there's here an authorization for the government to seize, to confiscate. But the government isn't taking from you. You've got to realize the underlying assumption is it wasn't yours to begin with. And so all the conservative arguments about incentives don't really matter. The question, how do you deal with thieves? You don't provide them with incentives. You punish them. You take away their ill-gotten gains. The second part of anti-colonialism, quite apart from the idea of theft, is also the idea that America and American power is very bad for the world. In other words, that America is not a force of freedom, but America is actually a force of exploitation. And if you look at the dual movement of Obama's policies, domestic and foreign policy, they, they're kind of linked. What's he doing? Uh, domestically, he is expanding the power of the state at home. And internationally, he is shrinking or contracting the power of the United States. So it's a scissors motion. He's expanding state power locally, and he is reducing America's power in the world. Why would Obama support oil drilling abroad, but not here? It has nothing to do with environmentalism. I don't believe Obama could care whether the earth is getting hotter or colder. He doesn't know. He doesn't care. 
What he's attempting is global energy redistribution. He's trying to make sure that the previously colonized countries have more energy so they can grow faster. And he's putting the, the expense on what he sees to be the colonizer, which is to say, us. Why is Obama prom promiscuously spending money as if the deficit didn't matter? It's very obvious that if the Republicans didn't have the Congress, he would have spent a lot more. The reason he's doing it, I believe, is because he is using debt as a way to settle America's colonial debt. In other words, the idea here is that America owes the world big time, trillions of dollars. Now, Obama knows I can't possibly propose a foreign aid program. Even Democrats wouldn't vote for that much giveaway. But now think about how debt achieves the same result. Because if our children and grandchildren are saddled with trillions of dollars of debt, they're going to have to pay it back. And to whom? Well, a good deal of that debt is owed by the Kuwaitis, is owned by the uh, Saudis, is owned by the Chinese. Debt becomes a form of global redistribution. And now consider the so-called Arab Spring. Why is Obama intervening over here, but not over there? Two dictators have been kicked out, Gaddafi in Libya and Mubarak in Egypt. And a whole bunch of dictators are still in place, as, as I speak, Assad holding on to power in Syria, and the mullahs in Iran. So what does Gaddafi and Mubarak have in common? Answer, to some degree, they are allied with the United States. Now, Gaddafi is a thug, I admit it, but since 2002, he was being a relatively well-behaved thug. <laughs> He's doing business with America, outing terrorists, uh, paying reparations for the Lockerbie bombing. Mubarak was our biggest ally in the region, not counting Israel. They're out. Who's in? Assad is our deadly enemy, supporter of Hezbollah, and in fact, close ally of the mullahs in Iran. So what's going on here? I mean, am I, am I, do I have the temerity to suggest that Obama is actually, um, does he hate America? Is he trying to uh, destroy the country? Well, here's what he's trying to do. He's trying to reduce America's footprint in the Middle East and in the world because he thinks we've been stepping on the world. How does he do that? The way he does that is by undermining America's allies and by allowing our enemies to gain strength. Obama has, for example, done virtually nothing significant to block Iran from getting a nuclear bomb. Meanwhile, he's slashing America's nuclear arsenal. When Obama came to power, America had um, 5,000 warheads. Now, by the START Treaty, we're down to 1,500 warheads. Obama has asked the Pentagon to study taking us down to 300 warheads. And then he goes around saying he dreams of a world free of nuclear weapons. Kind of a nice dreamy idea, I guess. But here's the problem. China is building and modernizing its arsenal. Uh, so is Pakistan. So is North Korea. Iran is trying to get a nuclear bomb. So in reality, while Obama articulates this dream, the only country whose nuclear weapons he can actually reduce are his own. And why is he doing it? He's doing it to level the nuclear playing field. He's essentially slashing America's nuclear arsenal so that he can end the era of American superiority, where America is globally dominant. He's trying to make, he's trying to restore the world before colonialism. We lived in the year 1500 and looked around the world. There were several great powers, China, India, the Arab Islamic world, the civilizations of the Americas. It was a multipolar world without a single superpower like America. I believe Obama wants us to go back to that world. So where does this really leave us? I think one of the powerful things about our film 2016 is it shows Obama's agenda in his own words. It links them to his actions and it shows what the likely next move is going to be in a number of key areas. Ultimately, with Obama, you can't understand where he's going if you don't know his, his, his core ideology. Remember, it, we haven't even seen the real Obama. We'll see the real Obama only in the second term. 
A first-term president is kind of tethered to public opinion. He has to maintain constituencies. In the second term, in a sense, he can come out of the closet. He can be himself. So I think with Obama, we're facing a very interesting challenge, which is, does America want to go this way? O Obama's not a traditional Democrat. I'm sure if you went to Bill Clinton or Kerry or Gore and said, is it a good thing for America to be number one in the world? They'd say, yeah, of course it is. I think from Obama's point of view, it would be perfectly fine if America were number 18 or number 64 in the world. Just one normal country like Finland or Greece or Somalia at the great dining table of nations. So in my view, that's Obama's goal. It isn't just that he hates America. He's fundamentally looking at America through global eyes. And what he's trying to do is right the ship of the world that he sees as being wrong side up for 500 years, ever since Columbus set out. This age of European superiority and now American superiority, Obama would like to see that end. And can you imagine if one man could do that in eight years? Uh, sure, at the end of eight years, America would be a lot poorer. America would be a lot weaker. America would cease to be a special country. The American passport would have no greater worth around the world. America's currency wouldn't be anything special. And probably a lot of Americans would despise Obama. But at that point, I think he wouldn't really care. Why? Because he will have achieved almost single-handedly what no one has been able to do before. No Roman emperor could have single-handedly brought down the Roman Empire. While people talked about ending the British Empire, it took two destructive world wars to do that. I think in 2016, as Obama gets ready to clean out his office, whatever his reputation in America, if he can achieve his goals, he will ultimately be vindicated by that still small voice in his own head that says to him, well done, thou true and faithful servant. Thank you very much. Thank you. I believe we, uh, do we have a few minutes for questions? I believe we do. Yes. Uh, qu questions from the audience? And we have, uh, yeah, we have mic roving microphones for them too. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Um, first of all, I just want to say um, I've really enjoyed Roots of Obama's Rage. I think it's the best example of figuring out where the man's true, why he does what he does. So I want to thank you for all the work you did on that. My question is, I know your documentary is about 2016, but if there is a God in heaven and we throw this man out of office this year, what do you think he will try to do as an ex-president to further the uh, dreams from his father? The question is, what would, um, what would Obama look to do in a, in a second term. By the way, the, my earlier book, The Roots of Obama's Rage, was published in 2010. And um, it covered about 15 months of the Obama presidency. So it was a book that advanced a, sort of a bold theory about Obama. But there wasn't enough that Obama did that could prove or disprove the theory. Uh, the new book, which is Obama's America, is able to look at the full four years of the Obama presidency and also begin to look forward. To answer your question very briefly, um, I think if we look forward to 2016, if, if I were Obama, and if I'm trying to achieve a shrinking of, let's say, America's footprint in the world, how would I do it? First of all, I would be very, I would be focused on the problem of the state of Israel. Why? Because Israel, in my view, in Obama's view, is a little colonial power sitting on Muslim land. And the people fighting Israel, from that point of view, are seen as freedom fighters. By the way, this helps to explain why Obama is wrongly perceived as a secret Muslim. He's actually not. But he seems weirdly sympathetic to Muslim jihadis fighting against America and Israel. That's what causes people to think he is a Muslim. 
But I think that the reason he supports those guys is he sees those guys as occupied people pushing out the occupiers. So one question for Obama would be, and this would be um, a very difficult and bold question, how do I remove the state of Israel? Remember, if you're an anti-colonialist, it's not enough to give the West Bank and Gaza. Israel itself is sitting on Muslim land. You have to figure out a way to give all that land back. That's the first challenge for Obama. So in my book, I outline how Obama, I think, can do that. And the second challenge is in the Middle East, there are three important countries. There's Egypt, there's Iran, and there's Saudi Arabia. Uh, since 1979, Egypt has been in the hands of the radical Muslims. No, I'm sorry, Iran has been in the hands of the radical Muslims. But Iran was unsuccessful in exporting its Khomeini revolution. So for 25 years, it was just Iran. Now Egypt is on its way into the radical Islamic orbit. And that leaves, to my mind, one country, Saudi Arabia. So if I were Obama, I would in the second term demand that the Saudi royal family put itself on the ballot against the Muslim Brotherhood. I'd say, we in America support democracy. You've got to be Democrats. Put your names on the ballot and let's see who wins. It's kind of obvious who would win that election, by the way. It would be the Muslim Brotherhood. And if that happens, then the radical Muslims control the tripod of three significant countries in the region. We begin to move a little bit closer to a prospect that I call the United States of Islam, which is the unification of the Middle East under a single power uh, and the restoration after 500 years of Islam as a global power. So these are some of the, I think, very important. And, and notice here, I'm not wildly conjecturing. I'm talking about things that have already happened and what the logical next step would be. Next question. Uh, when will 2016 be available on DVD? <laughs> oh, before the election? Yeah, 2016 and DVD. The, so the film is currently, well, as of now, it's in 130 theaters. I want to say it's doing really well, by the way. It's in the top 10 films in America. Um, um, so it's going to ramp up. So 600 theaters next Friday, and we hope to be everywhere by the time, by the time of uh, uh, early September when Americans really begin to focus uh, as a country on, on politics. So the film will remain in, in the theaters through September, maybe the first week of October, and we'll have one month after that to do DVDs, home box office, uh, various other formats, um, uh, television. Uh, so the, um, the DVD will be in the, in the last four weeks uh, leading, up to the, uh, leading up to the election. Yes. Uh, wonderful speech, <clears throat> wonderful program. What do you think is in Obama's uh, college records that he's got them sealed and his work record, and why does he have a selective service card from Connecticut when he never lived in Connecticut? Part two, what do you think his relationship is to the biblical Antichrist? Um, Obama... Um we te there tends to be a lot of um, emphasis on, this, on, the, on, the, on the sort of birther controversy with Obama, but interestingly, Obama took the SAT to get into college, but his SAT score is unknown. Uh, at Columbia, his grades and GPA are unknown. He wrote a thesis, its contents are unknown. He took the law school admissions test to go into Harvard Law School, his LSAT score, unknown. Uh, the New York Times wanted to interview people who knew Obama when he was a student at Columbia. Uh, not even his classmates, people who may have roomed with him or even janitors who cleaned his apartment. They couldn't find a single person alive who knew Obama. And Obama flatly refused to provide any such information. Um, Obama, uh, recently in David Marinus' book about Obama, he uh, names a girl who dated Obama. Uh, claims that she was the girlfriend that Obama refers to in his own book, but this, their stories don't match. And when Marinus went to Obama, Obama said, no, I actually had lots of girlfriends, but, which is interesting because none of them have come forward. No journalist has ever interviewed any one of them. Uh, and so um, this is a man with many black holes in his biography. 
Uh, and uh, I think this is a, uh, the result. When, when we were um, doing our film, we'd be in Hawaii, we'd be in Indonesia, we'd talk to people who were related to the Obamas, knew his dad, knew his mom, his mom's thesis advisor, knew young Obama. And I'd ask him, well, when were you last interviewed? And they were like, we've never been interviewed. No one's been down here. So incredibly, this guy is, um, this is the biggest story in America, and it is being truly uncovered, not covered, uh, in the mainstream press. It's a little bit of a scandal, I think, and it's um, not good for our democratic politics. It's not just the liberal media, by the way. The liberal media was pretty tough on Clinton and on Carter. There's another factor that's going on here that leads people in the press not only to not cover Obama, but when incriminating information surfaces to try to squelch it and spike it and discredit the people who are, who are bringing it out. And that gives you a little preview of the kind of reaction you can expect as our film goes national. Thank you. Let's go to the next question. Yes, sir. Each of us knows people that would not come here. Each of us knows people that you could not even have a logical discussion about the contents of this whole seminar, yourself and the other speakers included. Um, each of us in this room is probably going to go see this movie. I know I am. All right. The people who... Do you think the people who are not here, the people that refuse to talk about it, will go to this movie? And perhaps those guys standing out front. Yeah, the question is about... Um really kind of how do you get independence, let's say, into the theater? Uh, and the answer to this will seem a little paradoxical. Independents, by and large, don't go to see political films, political documentaries, even docudramas, however well made. Uh, uh, the way to make the film succeed is actually for conservatives en masse to go to it. Because if the film is a massive success among conservatives, the liberals will start screaming. And when the liberals start screaming, I don't know if you saw, a couple days ago I was on a, a Piers Morgan. Um, and if you looked at him, he had a, a very constipated look on his face <laughs> for a, a whole half hour. Uh, but he was sputtering. I mean, his basic question was, was you can't say that. You, you can't possibly believe that. Um, so liberal indignation is actually part of, is, it's written right into our marketing strategy. Um, <laughs> And, uh, <laughs> but the point being, when, when the independents hear that, oh, everyone's talking about this, there's a big hubbub about it, hey, I'm going to be voting in a few months, let me go see the film. That's how you get independence into the theater. So there's actually something that you can do, even if you have like-minded friends, it is important for a conservative films generally don't make it into the theater. It's really important that our film do well in order to generate the kind of debate and have the kind of reach that we, we need to have. Yes? Um, what really baffles me, as much as we do know about Obama, at least some of us, and based upon your research and some other books that have been published, how are the liberals able to uh, keep all this out of the mainstream press when a conservative mentions anything about uh, his birth certificate or where he attended college, that's his Occidental. We, I mean, we have every reason to believe he never did attend Occidental. Uh, there must be tremendous money like Soros or somebody like Soros that has been sponsoring Obama like the chosen one to save the world. Uh, he, he's gotten away, I, I don't want to use the word murder, but he's gotten away with what was physically, was impossible a few years ago. Yeah. Um, I think with Soros and Obama, you're dealing with two meteors that are coming from different places but happen to be firing in the same direction. I don't think Obama's a pawn of Soros and neither is Soros a pawn of Obama's. Soros represents European anti-Americanism that European disdain and disgust that this sort of a new barbaric country is at the top of the world. Uh, and Soros has that kind of familiar European um, condescension and I think animus toward America. Um, Obama's animus is coming from uh, different shores. It's third world anti-Americanism that was baked 
in the uh, anti-colonial atmosphere of the 60s and 70s. Um, there is anti-colonialism in Europe also, but here's the big difference. European anti-colonialism is based on guilt, but third world anti-colonialism is based on rage. And while those two can intersect, they're actually a different emotion. So uh, these are ships that are moving in the same direction, so to speak. Um, so that's, that's the point. I, I think with Obama, it's not that he's a pawn of someone. The key to Obama's success is he has a secret weapon. And what's his secret weapon? His secret weapon is that he is able to offer white America a certificate of racial absolution. Um, this, is not, this is not because, this is not simply by virtue of being an African American president. It is by virtue of being a special kind of African American president, not Jesse Jackson, not Al Sharpton. Uh, Ob Obama allows people to feel really good about supporting him. And so you think about a guy, thinking about a guy like Chris Matthews, whom I'm, I, I met Chris Matthews 25 years ago and debated him. Uh, and Chris Matthews is a pretty hard bitten guy. Uh, Tip O'Neill's chief of staff, would hang out with the longshoremen in Boston. Yet you notice when he talks about Obama, he's, he becomes absurdly effeminate. I mean, he talks about uh, <laughs> thrills running down his leg. Uh, he embarrasses himself and his family, and even us as viewers. Now, why does he do that? Like, why does he do that? The reason he does that is it's nothing to do with Obama. Chris Matthews is simply basking in his own wonderfulness. He's basically patting himself on the back, saying, I, Chris Matthews, am such a morally admirable person that I can vote for Barack Obama. So there is a sort of incredible... Uh, power uh, that you see in the mainstream media in which it is seen as morally important for the United States and for them for Obama to succeed. And that's part of the reason why you have this sort of media support for Obama. Just briefly as an extension of uh, what I said earlier, uh, I thought we had a constitution and a Congress that would make it impossible for a man like Obama to become President of the United States, let alone keep his job for a second term. By that I mean, you know, he uses executive orders to do what he wants to do. Congress is not standing up. I realize conservatives don't control both houses, but he's gotten away with a lot of stuff that would not be permissible in our Constitution. And, and yet Congress has been unable to block it. Yeah, I, I, um, I want to move on just to, get, just to bring in more questions. Go ahead, sir. Thanks, Bill Costin. I uh, mentioned you mentioned that Obama using the tool of debt to redistribute the wealth of the United States. Um, I'm wondering. I read a lot about investment literature and gold and silver and debt and how we are, are the Federal Reserve the way it works. Do you envision, based on your understanding of him, that he's going to use the tool of runaway hyperinflation, 50, 60 percent, to destroy the American? middle class and the dollar. Question is about debt and, and of course inflation, which is the most familiar way to deal with debt. In effect, you just print money uh, and devalue the money that's already uh, out there now. Uh, for a while, when I was thinking about my book, Obama's America, my new book, I was wrestling with this and thinking, if Obama has these policies are going to not only hurt the rich, but they're actually going to hurt a lot of ordinary Americans. Uh, and even poor Americans. Quite frankly, if you start printing money, rich people don't generally have their money in cash. Uh, poor people are more likely to have dollar bills that are going to drop in value to, in effect, 50, 50 cents or whatever. So why would Obama do this if it would hurt the middle class, if it would hurt the poor? And then it occurred to me, the middle class and the poor are not poor by world standards. In other words, if we, we, we talk about the 1%, the 99%, and you know, I, I, my office in New York is just outside Occupy Wall Street, so I kind of look out at these Occupy guys, and they all feel like we're the 99%. You know, in the offices are all the one percenters. But they're thinking of in America. But if you apply a global standard, you see that even middle class Americans, well, even poor Americans, if you make $20,000 a year, you're wealthy by world standards. And so from the anti-colonial point of view, even you ought to pay. 
So bottom line is that these, um, very often in talking about Obama, we've got to resist the kind of rhetoric you hear all over television and even on the conservative side, which is sort of, Obama doesn't realize that confiscatory taxation will not really help the economy. He's not trying to help the economy. Uh, Obama doesn't realize that Assad is not our friend. And the mullahs in Iran, well, if we slash our nuclear weapons, this will not inspire the mullahs in Iran to do the same. I believe Obama already knows that. He's not trying to motivate the mullahs in Iran. He's just trying to do what he's doing. In other words, even as conservatives, we think Obama is trying to do X, but he's getting Y. And I'm saying no. Obama's not getting results opposite to what he intends. He intends the results he's getting. Good afternoon. Welcome to Michigan. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'd like to be able to donate $60 to defray the cost of your $1,000 gift to George Obama. <laughs> if... <laughs> If you don't want to take it for yourself, please, next time he decides to uh, ask for money, add it in there. Conservatives tend to dig in their own pockets and solve problems. Liberals tend to look at the government and say, take care of it. Well, I think George is doing okay. And with your permission, I will buy uh, some tickets to the film and give them to some young people who might not otherwise go. That would be fine. My very quick question is simply, if Obama is given a second term, what types of changes in his administration or in his cabinet? We know, of course, that Cass Sunstein is leaving. What types of changes do you see happening that would help him achieve his goals? Godspeed. Well, I think Obama has had to, in his personnel appointments, um, be a little bit cautious in the first term. Um, partly because he was new. He needed to figure out how to uh, operate and maneuver. Uh, and so he started with some Clinton people. Uh, and he realized uh, pretty soon that the Clinton people would, uh, were trying to block him. Uh, they were trying to block him, why? Because they're traditional Democrats. So if you look, for example, in Bob Woodward's book, he talks about the fact that again and again, on Iraq and Afghanistan, and by the way, the issue in Iraq and Afghanistan is not should America get out. Bush would have pulled us out as well. The intention was always to get out. It's the peculiar way Obama operates. So for example, what Obama will do is he will say, we, he will open up secret negotiations with the Taliban. He will say, we are trying to find good Taliban. Interestingly, since 9-11, these good Taliban have yet to surface. But uh, apparently, the Obama people are, are doing business with them. Point being that this, Obama's approaches again and again, are opposed by Hillary Clinton, opposed by the Defense Department, opposed by key people around him. And this is why the whole idea that Obama is a big fat bungler is not true. Obama has actually redefined the citizen's relationship to the government. He has redefined our foreign policy. He shrunk our footprint in the world. He has achieved more in one term than just about any Democrat since FDR from his point of view. Now, from our point of view, we see him as not doing the things that we want and we think he's foolish, but he doesn't intend to do those things. So by his own standard, he is succeeding spectacularly, and we can expect him to do to succeed even more in second term, if he gets one. Yes. Yeah, hey, uh, I uh, recently been trying to you uh, lately through uh, what's so great about Christianity, and I've heard uh, several of your debates with uh, Christopher Hitchens and uh, Richard Dawkins. I definitely don't want to get off topic, but. Um, I'm curious, are you um, going to be continuing with that, or is this kind of just like a transition given our uh, unstable uh, future here, or is this something you'll always continue to do? Well, the question is a little bit about uh, my sort of second career. I'm, I'm the president of a, liber a liberal arts college called the King's College. It's a Christian college. And so I, I sort of have one foot in two worlds. I, I write about politics, and I've been doing that for 25 years, and I'm, I'm a secular writer. Uh, but in the last few years, I've been um, uh, taking on many of the leading new atheists around the country and debating them on campuses. Uh, Christopher Hitchens was my, uh, my most um, formidable uh, opponent, and obviously we miss him. He died f some months ago. So, yeah, I'm still doing three or four of those debates a year. I feel it's, uh, it's, it, keeps the, uh, it keeps us thinking about the big questions that remain really important. Uh, but my attention now and certainly over the next several months is... Um, 
is, is focused very much on, um, on Obama. Hey, I realized I, uh, I didn't address the question about the Antichrist. Uh, uh, somewhat like the mosquito at the nudist colony, I'm not sure where to begin with that one. Uh, <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Um, thanks for coming here today to Michigan. There are some people in Michigan who will listen. Um, you made a comment about the possibility in eight years of a single person destroying America. I agree with you. I think that if Reagan was known as the great communicator, Obama's legacy will be the great destroyer. And life itself testifies to the truth of what you say. It took years to build the towers. It took a couple of hours to knock them down. It's harder to build a business than to destroy it. But at any rate, you made a comment in 2016 when Obama cleans out his desk. My thing is, he so hates our Constitution that what makes you think we'll ever have elections after that or that he'll do away with term limits. So. The question is about, um, about Obama and uh, once again, the, does he hate America? See, I think he subscribes to an ideology that uh, wants a very different America. Um, in, the, in the late 19th century, there was a debate uh, in Britain Britain was then at the peak of its influence uh, between uh, Disraeli, the British uh, then Prime Minister, and his opponent, uh, William Gladstone, uh, about the issue of empire. And Disraeli said uh, to the British, what makes us great is we are a world power. What makes us great is that we have the largest economy in the world. We matter. Uh, and this is what defines British greatness. And Gladstone said, no. He said, um, I am for, and this was his phrase, little England. He says, we should give up this empire. We don't need it. We should go back to our small plots of land, uh, grow our petunias, uh, tend to our vegetable gardens, uh, and be content uh, that way. Interestingly, Gladstone could not realize his own vision. Like I said earlier, it, it took two world wars to bring down the British Empire. But Across the span of time, I think we get here an insight into Obama. Obama believes in little America. And by that, he means a smaller economy, a smaller American role in the world. Um, Obama says this, by the way, indirectly. Many times he says, we have 5% of the world's population, but we use 25% of the world's resources and energy and oil. What's he saying? He's saying we are consuming beyond our share. He would like us to eat 5% of the world's food and wear 5% of the world's clothes uh, and have 5% of the world's wealth. So Obama implicitly set forward his standard. And the standard is not racial reparations. It's global uh, reparations. So I think that's a realizable goal in eight years. Remember that America has only been the world's sole superpower for 20 years. America has been a superpower since World War II. So this American era, 1945, uh, could actually come to an end by 2016. And quite honestly, if it does, Obama has nothing left to do. Now, maybe he just wants to enjoy the trappings of power, but he will have actually achieved his goal, if I'm correct, that that is actually his goal. Yes. I was wondering what your thoughts are about why President Obama authorized the military action uh, that ultimately killed uh, Osama bin Laden. Uh, do you think he did this for political reasons, or do you think there were other considerations at work? Obama, in his um, um, book, The Audacity of Hope, makes a very interesting observation about bin Laden. He says, and I quote him now, like this quote isn't from my, my book, uh, Obama's America. He says about bin Laden, quote, he's no Ho Chi Minh. Think about that for a minute. He's no Ho Chi Minh. What's Obama saying? He's talking to liberals. He's saying to liberals, Ho Chi Minh was a good guy. Ho Chi Minh was a true nationalist. He was a true freedom fighter. He was trying to push the French and then the Americans out of Vietnam. He's a good guy. Obama is not a freedom, I mean, uh, Osama is not a freedom fighter in the same sense. Why? Because he's not defending his own country against American occupation. He's 
uh, joining with a bunch of gangsters to come and knock down our buildings in a different country. So from Obama's point of view, there's an important distinction. Islamic jihadis fighting in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and you may say in Palestine, they're freedom fighters. They should be given constitutional rights, closed on Guantanamo, treat them like U.S. citizens. But bin Laden, uh, al-Zawari, the al-Qaeda guys, they're gangsters, international criminals. Send the sheriff to go get them. So there is no inconsistency in what I'm saying. It fully explains why Obama would use force against bin Laden while remaining oddly solicitous toward Muslim jihadis in so-called occupied territories. Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Daniel, and uh, I'm a returning veteran from, from uh, my fifth deployment to Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My, my question is regarding um, the drawdown in Afghanistan and also the total drawdown of forces worldwide and also the force as a whole, the U.S. military. Do you feel that he uh, wants to dismantle the U.S. military or is there some other reason behind this? When the question is about the military and resources to the military, you know, when Obama is asked about the military and military cuts, and there have been some deep cuts, he says we can't afford it. Uh, and, and, uh, it's a necessary evil. Right. No, I, I, I agree. It's, I agree. But what I'm trying to say is Obama suggests that, look, we, we're in a budget crisis. We can't afford military spending. But interestingly, he doesn't feel that way about other domestic spending. Um, he's letting every other uh, division grow. Uh, so this gives you a sense of Obama's sort of priorities. Now, the truth of it is if you want to slash nuclear weapons, you can. But you have to increase conventional forces. Uh, because think about it. Uh, China can put 80 to 100 million people on the battlefield. We can't. Uh, we rely on technology and superior tech, uh, force to counter that kind of, a, let's say, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. Now, we don't need nuclear weapons, but then we need to be able to put a lot of boots on the ground, ships, uh, planes. So uh, conventional uh, forces are costlier than nuclear bombs. Um, and yet what Obama's doing is, again, with blind disregard for all these trade-offs that have been known for decades, he's just slashing both. He's slashing the military, and he's also dramatically drawing down our nuclear forces. So what's going on? I mean, I, I think Obama's strategy is the opposite of Reagan's, peace through weakness. Um, and, uh, and, and to put it even more sharply, historically, if Reagan deserves some credit for the dissolution of the Soviet empire, it may be that, o that Obama will have to get some historical credit for helping to produce the United States of Islam. Thank you. Uh, two quick questions here. I've heard some rumblings that uh, if things aren't looking good for his re-election, he'll impose martial law. Your thoughts on that? And two, God forbid, if he does get re-elected, what can we do to, to stop him from bringing us down? The first question is about martial law. And look, I think the, I won't speculate on that sort of thing. I, I think that we have plenty to go on with what Obama is actually doing. We can assess uh, the things that he's done, and we can infer what the next steps might be. Um, if Obama is reelected, look, um, I think that those of us who believe in a different dream, I'm an immigrant. Right? So I believe, I love America, I believe in the American dream. To me, the great paradox is I'm a third world guy who's embraced America. Obama is an American born guy who's embracing a third world ideology. So we've actually traveled opposite paths. Uh, and uh, while it is true, as someone said a moment earlier, that it's easier to pull a fence down than to build one up, uh, I do think that there's enormous uh, resilience in the American people. The people say, well, the American people were so dumb they voted for Obama in the first place. No, no. Uh, first of all, uh, Obama didn't disclose who he was. A lot of people voted their best ideals with Obama. They basically said that this is a symbol of America getting beyond its racial past. Um, it would be great to have a president who looks like Obama and represents what Obama represents. So Obama knew, knew that, and he was able to use that sort of hidden power. Um, 
But I think now, four years later, and this is part of the message of our film, is, you know, four years ago, we didn't know Obama. Now we do. So now the, the real decision-making power is not in his hands, it's not in my hands. It's in the hands of the American people. Yes. Hi, I'm Stan Ennis from uh, this area, but I'm an alumnus of the King's College, and I want to thank you for what you have been do doing for King's College and also what you're doing for this nation. And my question to you is, uh, how can we, as parents and grandparents, help our families and our friends uh, think right <laughs> when it comes to the, um, our country and uh, what they, that they can do what they can do for, to um, make sure that we keep our country that we, what our grandparents did? Thank you. The question is, how do we how do we get people to think hard about these issues and about America? Sometimes in a, at the King's College, I'm talking to these Christian students, and they, uh, in making arguments, they tend to uh, um, resort uh, and appeal to the Bible. And I say to them, wait, think for a moment. It used to be 50 years ago that America was a sort of a Christian culture. And you could appeal reflexively, or Judeo-Christian if you want, you could appeal to the Ten Commandments, and everyone kind of agreed that that's a good way to live. And everyone kind of agreed that the Bible is an authoritative, if not the Word of God. But I said, but wait a minute. Now we're living largely in secular culture. And that consensus is somewhat dissolved. So if you're going to make arguments about gay marriage or any other subject, you, it's not going to be enough just to quote from the book of Leviticus or the Gospel of Matthew. You're going to need to have a different language to get through to people who don't share your assumptions. Now, why am I saying this? Exactly the same thing is true with modern American conservatism. Conservatism was once the native language uh, of American politics. But because of some dramatic shifts in our culture, accelerated by Obama, that language is now unfamiliar and strikes people as a certain kind of insider baseball talk. Uh, so it's really important, again, uh, if you want to reach across the aisle or reach out to the middle, to find a conservative language that doesn't rely on a certain kind of in-house cliche. You can't say stuff like, you know, Obama's against freedom. Because actually, Obama's for a certain type of freedom. He, yeah, he may be against economic freedom, but he's certainly, he's certainly for greater sexual freedom. He, so in other words, what kind of freedom are we talking about that we want to advance? So Again, things that, were that we understand within the room are not necessarily understood in the larger society. One way we help our young people think about these questions is to return to first principles. And a really good place to start is, of course, the American founding. Yes. That seems to be a nice segue to my question. Um, when I hear Obama, when I hear um, hardcore Democrats speak, liberals, they have their own sense of righteousness. They have a true sense of justice. It's just very different from ours. And they have a, a real set of core principles. And our country has come so far, and the church is utterly confused on even biblical values, a biblical worldview, that I find it's actually easier for me to talk to someone in the secular world than a pastor of a church. Can you comment on the role of pastors of the church in America? Because when I look at, if we just had unity amongst ourselves, we could take back this country. I mean, I do think that the pastor in some ways today is, um, in an, is in a difficult position in secular culture because pastors study the Bible. They go to divinity school. And uh, yet sitting in their own pews are lots of people who are engineers and scientists and are reading about the Higgs boson and the, Higgs and the God particle. And this is not something pastors know anything about. So they're disconnected in some ways from the great explosion of knowledge in the world, uh, in brain science, uh, in, in astrophysics, but also in economics. So I think that there is an important task to be done uh, in importing that kind of knowledge, either educating the pastors or creating church structures where non-pastors can come in and address the ways in which theological issues relate 
to economic issues, political issues, scientific issues, and so on. Uh, otherwise, you're basically creating, you could call it, you know, um, uh, Christians on Sunday and secular people the rest of the week. Uh, the broader point I want to make politically in, in, in this connection, however, is this. I don't think that this election is about a, a normal liberal conservative debate uh, because Obama is not a traditional liberal. Liberals want to redistribute income in America, and you're a bigger liberal to the degree you want to redistribute more. Obama wants to realign America in the world. That is a different agenda completely. Uh, and I think, for me, through the film, through my book, exposing that agenda is the way of challenging Obama in his own constituency. Um, uh, even African Americans have taken devastating economic losses, but they hang with Obama. Because why? Because they think, well, he's one of us. He's our champion. One of the things you see in the film is we don't argue this point, but as you follow the film, you're in Hawaii, you're in Indonesia, you're in Pakistan, you're in Kenya. You suddenly realize this is not Selma, this is not Montgomery, this is not the, this is not the segregationist South. This guy has had a very different history. You don't say it, but you show it. And then people go, wow, maybe, uh, you know, liberals are puzzled. Like, Why doesn't Obama seem to care about the poor? Typical answer, he's too cerebral. He's very professorial. He, he thinks at such a high level that he doesn't connect uh, with ordinary emotional issues. Dinesh's theory, Obama doesn't seem to care about the poor because he doesn't. Um, his focus is on pulling down the rich. Um, you don't need another theory. Um, so bottom line is that with Obama, you're dealing with a new kind of guy. Now, there's no question in my book, my film, they're going to attack us and say, you know, why are you doing all this? Why are you getting into his past and so on? Uh, when I was on uh, C-SPAN a couple of years ago, Jonathan Alter says, he says, in America, Dinesh, we don't judge people by what their fathers believe. Ronald Reagan's father was an alcoholic. And yet we don't judge Reagan by what his father thought. I said, well, yeah, but Reagan didn't write a book called Dreams from My Father. Uh, you know, Obama has made his multiculturalism, his history, his past, his story, the centerpiece of who he is. Never once has he said, oh, you know, I did some crazy things when I was in my 20s and 30s, but I've, I've, I'm way over that now. That was my Ted Kennedy moment, uh, but I've matured. No, uh, to this day, if he's asked questions, he goes, go, go read my book. I wrote a 400-page book. It's all in there. So Obama claims his past. He claims this multicultural history, and all we're saying is, let's just examine just quite how multicultural it really is. Uh, and what these influences really are. Uh, and let's just not read his book by saying, oh, here's a funny name multicultural guy, and here's another funny name multicultural guy. Let's realize this guy was a dangerous revolutionary, and this guy used to blow up bridges, and this guy tried to bomb the Pentagon, uh, and this guy has called for the destruction of Israel, so that once you can actually put a story together that in a way hasn't been told, and I think that's why people are responding to our film with such a force of revelation, it's, it's not because we're master sleuths. It's just because the story has, in a way, not been told. Uh, and it's a story that very much needs to be told. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. For more information, visit the author's website, dineshdesouza.com.